session of the of the conference that will be tomorrow morning, but the final session of today and and yesterday. And uh, <clears throat> before giving the floor to His Eminence Cardinal Tagle, let me just very quickly, also for his uh, <laughs> information, uh, say what we've done. Uh, I think this morning someone here, some of the panel, uh, it was Dr. Um, Heck, I think, who said how terrible that think tanks all over the world and opinion and the opinion in general didn't read the signs announcing the catastrophes we are seeing. And that was the case for the financial crisis. And again, it's the case for the refugee crisis which perhaps you see from a different point of view from Asia. Uh, but uh, mm, for Europe, uh, we are in the learning process, in a learning process which is terrible because those who are suffering are, are, the, are the others. So, uh, that's, uh, so that, that's the context. Uh, in this context, we had a first session on entrepreneurship in the fight against poverty, and then a second uh, panel session about the refugee question. And there were kind of also solo moments, like uh, in an opera, as uh, Thomas Rusche said before. No, but there were some solo arias, uh, very important. Cardinal Pell at the beginning gave us some important ideas on how to approach faith and the economy. Monsignor Celli this morning uh, helped us in the meditation about the Samaritan. Uh, Nikolaus von Bohmhard just gave a, at all his experience about uh, business life, company, leading a company, and uh, taking decisions which are not only compatible but inspired by his personal uh, religious uh, commitment. And we had Professor Bonici who presented the uh, proposed, the idea of the Voluntary Solidarity Fund, an idea on which we shall continue discussing, which if it, again, if it comes, if it goes ahead, will be something outside the Fondazione Centesimus Annus Pro Pontifice and the Vatican. It is a larger idea in a way, and uh, it could become very important, but it is still in the first stages of discussion. And uh, certainly it is an example of what each of us uh, can, could do to really change the attitude of the Catholic and the Christian worlds in terms of solidarity. Uh, in the group reports, we are going to distribute widely, but uh, the secretaries have been extremely effective because I've already received both. Uh, I'm not going to, to read them, but I thank, uh, I would like to thank Mark De Micoli and, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Casey, Casey. Casey yes, uh, sorry, I don't, uh, your first name. Um, we'll, we'll use them, they have discussed the fund, they have discussed all the subjects we've had here, they have had, we had some, uh, quick exchanges and some discussion, debate about microcredit, whether it is, it is or whether it is not, and, and what it does and what it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> so we are going to use this material. It will be put at the disposal of uh, yourselves and many more people on the website and in publications. Um, <clears throat> now we are after the audience with the Holy Father this morning, which was an, a high moment because he was, I must say, extraordinarily and surprisingly generous in, his, in the way he attended, he listened, and he uh, said, uh, he encouraged each of us one by one. So it was really impressive. Uh, and I think uh, this is uh, a very important support and a very important challenge also, let's be clear, because if, I mean, he's also saying very important and challenging things, and uh, so it's not for complacency again, once again, it is to do more and to be more effective. 
And uh, that's where we are now and uh, in a process which will continue uh, designing perhaps elements of what could be a different model, but it will not be utopian because we are not utopian people. We are people <laughs> who are also active in the economy, but we are conscious of the fact that reform, reforms must be courageous at all levels. Now, I would like to introduce His Eminence, kind of, doesn't need introduction, but I, I, I read in the, he comes from Manila, of course, he's Archbishop of Manila since 2011, I read that in the Synod of, on the New Evangelization in 2012, he said, quote, the church must discover the power of silence. Confronted with the sorrows, doubts, and uncertainties of people, she cannot pretend to give easy solutions. The church's humility, respectfulness, and silence might reveal more clearly the face of God in Jesus. Now, this is extremely deep and... Uh, helpful, but still, we would like you to speak, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Domingo. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, buonasera, tutti. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this kind invitation. And, uh, you know, it is, a, it is refreshing to enter this uh, Synod Hall and to find, wow, more lay people than bishops. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, I have attended uh, six synods of bishops so far. And so this, this is my second home, this hall, you know, and uh, yeah, I tell you, it's really refreshing to see uh, all of you here. And uh, it is quite a, a difficult task to uh, give a, some sort of a concluding address after a long day, capped by an audience with the Pope, you know, who will be interested in... Uh, in a, in a, in a, in a closing remark like this, and I'm sorry to say that uh, I just arrived from Manila this morning, so I was not able to attend the the sessions. So you might hear a lot of repetition. You know? I'm giving you permission to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to add to your suffering. <laughs> uh, I would like to. Uh, focus my sharing with you on a theme that has been very dear, close to the heart of Pope Francis, and which in the Philippines has been the topic of various discussions and the fora and conferences these past years, which is about an economy at the service of inclusive growth. The Holy Father talks about it in a more negative way. He called it an economy of exclusion. And he says, we have to say no to it. Now, more positively, we want to propose an economy of inclusive growth. And uh, one of the signs of the times uh, or one of the actions of the Holy Spirit in the world and in the church these past decades has been the concern to achieve genuine, integral development of human beings, of societies, and indeed of the whole world, the whole of humanity. And the body of teaching that constitutes uh, the social doctrine of the church, especially these past six decades, confirms the validity of this sign of the time, the search of the human family for genuine human and social development. The terminologies have been changing, but it is still the same search. And uh, in these past decades it, uh, or years, it is growth that includes everyone, 
And in fact, we're asking the question, if growth is just for a few, do you call that growth? What type of growth is it when the, the bigger part of humanity remains in squalor or, 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 uh, or, or even in worsening situations? So what growth is that? Don't ask me to give the answer. No, I'm, I don't have the answer to. I'm just asking. <laughs> now, in 1967, the blessed Pope Paul VI published his encyclical uh, Popolorum Progressio on integral human development. The 20th anniversary of its publication was marked by uh, Saint Pope John Paul II with the encyclical Solicitudo Rei Socialis, and it tried to apply to contemporary situations the teachings of Popolorum Progressio. And a further 20 years later, in uh, 2009, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI devoted the encyclical Caritas in Veritate to a continuing reflection on Populorum Progressio, and he even calls Populorum Progressio the rerum novarum of the present age. Pope Benedict reminded us that the economic development envisioned by Pope Paul VI was meant to produce real growth of benefit to everyone and genuinely sustainable. But for Pope Paul VI, economic growth must be integrated into a fuller development of the human being. He said in Populorum Progressio number 20, and I quote, if further development calls for the work of more and more technicians, no, the word used was technicians, uh, you just used the word, uh, what, think tank. <laughs> the work of more and more technicians, even more necessary is the deep thought and reflection of wise people, wow, wise people in search of a new humanism which will enable modern people to find themselves anew by embracing the higher values of love and love and friendship, of prayer and contemplation. This is what will permit the fullness of authentic development, a development which is for each and all the transition from less human conditions to those that are more human. So aside from economic development, Pope Paul VI is saying, do we have time for friends? Do we have time for coffee or tea, do we have time? After my talk. <laughs> do we have time to pray? Do we have time to reflect? He says, we are human. And how can human beings develop when there is no time for reflection? Three weeks ago, I was in the, the conference of Caritas Italiana also on development and uh, the refugee question, etc. But the first question that was addressed to me during the open forum was this. He said, how do we remedy this situation? He said, I have a family, but because of my work, I don't have time anymore to sit with my children and leisurely talk with them. I don't have time anymore to ponder deep things. I have to rush into giving answers without deep thought. Paul VI would say that is part of human development. When I was younger, And I'm sure you were younger then, too. 
we would write letters. And it might take two weeks, three weeks to reach the, the, the addressee. And it would take them another three weeks to answer. But you waited. You waited. And then you read the letter and you spend time to answer. Now they send you an email. You know, and after a minute, they send you an SMS. They say, did you get my email? <laughs> and, say, huh? and then you say... <laughs> And then you say yes, and then say, oh, what's your answer? Uh, I mean, uh, should I respond now? You know? And sometimes the questions contained in the email is about heaven, hell, purgatory, limbo, and all of those, which you cannot respond to in, a, in an SMS. Can we not give each other time to be human? I mean, weak and also in need of time. Uh -huh. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I think you are experiencing what Pope Paul VI said in 1967. He was really a prophet. Now, Pope John Paul II, in uh, uh, Solicitudo Rei Socialis, number 14, sounded quite disappointed and disturbed seeing the world 20 years after Populorum Progressio. He says, looking at all the various sectors, the production and distribution of foodstuff, hygiene, health and housing, availability of drinking water, working conditions, especially for women, life expectancy and other economic and social indicators, the general picture is a disappointing one, both considered in itself and in relation to the corresponding data of the more developed countries. The word gap returns spontaneously to mind. The gap between the developed and the developing countries or underdeveloped countries. Pope Benedict XVI in Caritas in Veritate added, and I quote, it is true that growth has taken place since uh, Rerum Novarum, and it continues to be a positive factor that has lifted billions of people out of misery. Recently, it has given many countries the possibility of becoming effective players in international politics. Yet, it must be acknowledged that this same economic growth has been and continued to be weighed down by malfunctions and dramatic problems, highlighted even further by the current crisis, end of quote. And more recently, uh, you, you notice that I've been uh, quoting popes. <laughs> and now more recently, Pope Francis devoted a whole section to what he called an economy of exclusion in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. And in number 53, he says, and this is a rather long quote, uh, but please, uh, it's not me, uh, it's the Pope. No, okay, so, uh, <laughs> he says, just as the commandment, thou shalt not kill, sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life, today we also have to say, Thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. How can it be that it is not a news item when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure, but it is news when the stock market loses two points? This is a case of exclusion. 
Can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? This is a case of inequality. Today, everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape. Human beings are themselves considered consumer goods to be used and then discarded. We have created a throwaway culture which is now spreading. It is no longer simply about exploitation and oppression, but something new. Exclusion ultimately has to do with what it means to be a part of society in which we live. Those excluded are no longer society's underside or its fringes. They are no longer even a part of it. I remember when I was a young student in grade school, the teachers were very strict on observing the margins. Don't write beyond the margins. But the margins are still on the paper. The Pope is saying, those, we don't have any more people on the margins. They're even outside of the paper. So he says, don't use the term marginalized. Use the word outcast. The excluded, the leftovers. When we look at the progression and leading up to what Pope Francis says, we really have to be disturbed as human beings and as, as Christians. I would not even pretend before you this august body of experts to offer solutions to the concerns uh, raised. And the concerns are now acquiring a particular phase called the refugee emergency. There are many phases of the economy and the culture of exclusion, but one such phase is the emergency of the refugee problem. If we allow a broader approach to the issue of uh, the refugee emergency, and if we avoid the hair splitting that I hear very often now when I go to refugee camps, people will whisper to me, oh, he is not a refugee. He is an illegal migrant. <laughs> oh, this is not a refugee. He is, <clears throat> he or she is, is an economic migrant. So they're all the, all the classifications. You know? uh, what I'm saying is, can we forego those uh, hair splitting definitions for now? You know? uh, then we could very well include in the emergency situation the people displaced from their homeland, not only because of conflicts and terrorist activities but also because of poverty and natural calamities. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Nepal for the anniversary of the uh, earthquake. I'll tell you some of what I've seen later. Unfortunately, such forced movements of peoples very sad, have led to trafficking in human persons, new forms of slavery, new forms of prostitution, human smuggling. In other words, a multi-billion dollar or euro business has arisen because of this emergency. In one refugee camp that I visited, 
towards the end of the year, a regular bus ride from the city to the camp cost five euros. But for the refugees, 25 euros each. What we call an emergency situation is now a business. I wonder who are the business people around behind them. We should invite them to the Fundación meeting. I can hear Jesus speaking again. Indeed, the children of this world are wiser in dealing with their own kind. But we have to ask, what is the response of the children of light? So let me just propose a few points for reflection. You know, not solution, but reflection. Three, three short points. First, you have already heard this a number of times since yesterday, I suppose, and reaffirmed by Pope Francis this morning. The first proposal, a renewed vision of the human person, of society, of the economy and development. Looking at the body of the social teachings of the church, how do we achieve this renewed vision? And I have a few pro pro proposals. First, a return to a view of life as gift, as grace, or what Pope Benedict called the primacy of gratuitousness, which is ignored in a consumerist, pragmatic, and utilitarian vision of life. Last, uh, two weeks ago, I was invited by, by the Italian Episcopal Conference to, to give a talk to families. And that was one question I asked. In our utilitarian world, we might not look at each other anymore as a gift. So I asked them, husbands, do you still recognize a gift in your wives? Nobody dared to answer. And I was upset. I said, why can't they not declare, yes, my wife is a gift? So I asked the wives, do you see, what do you see in your husbands? A gift? They said, a problem. Uh, the husbands and wives who are here, please. <laughs> uh, when you ask your parents, the parents, how, how, do you look at, how do you look at your children? Do you see a gift of God? That's why children, the unborn, are, are considered a burden, etc. Even before they can do anything, they're not anymore considered gifts. And parents, I, and children, I ask them, children, uh, what do you see in your parents? A gift of God? or an ATM card. <laughs> I mean, a, a, a recovery of a horizon of gift, gratuitousness. Uh, a narrowly utilitarian view of life convinces us wrongly that we are the source and the author of ourselves, of life and of all aspects of society. Everything is about my achievement, Nothing is received. Receiving is even an insult. Nothing is, nothing is received, only achieved, and better if achieved single-handedly. Such a worldview eliminates gratitude. It eliminates trust, and it will eliminate genuine sharing. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, Jesus says, all these things, meaning what will I eat, what will I wear? He says, all these things the pagans seek. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given 
to you. Gratuitousness, fraternity and sorority come together. Pope Benedict observes that this emphasizes the value, I mean, uh, 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 our, our, our present state of economy emphasizes the value of commutative justice, where giving and receiving is reduced to a transaction based on strict equivalence. And that is okay, that is good, but it could lead to a forgetfulness of distributive and social justice rooted in solidarity and nurtured by a horizon of gift. To tell you the truth, if somebody borrows money from me, I do not think of it as my money being lent to the other person. So that in case the other person is not able to pay it back, I say, I did not lose anything. It is a gift. I see some <laughs> try to borrow from <laughs> and see whether the mindset is gift. <laughs> from me, yes. You can approach me after my talk. <laughs> yeah, this is hard teaching. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Contracts governing exchange between goods of equivalent value are necessary. But also necessary are just laws and forms of distribution of gifts. Let the gifts circulate. Genuine sharing and giving come only from brothers and sisters. And not all exterior acts of giving are altruistic. They could be manipulative and could violate the dignity of the recipient if not given as a gift coming from a brother or a sister. You know, one of my most unforgettable but harrowing experiences was to celebrate the funeral mass of two children, siblings. One was six years old, the other was five years old they died after eating food that their father picked up from the garbage can near a restaurant. But that was his usual way of feeding the family when he does not earn enough. He boils them, the food stuff, cooks them again, and feeds the children. But that fateful evening, they were poisoned. But then I, how do you, how do you preside at such a funeral? How do you preach the good news? And the question behind my my, my head was, why would food, why does food have to become garbage first before becoming food for the children? And the parents, the parents were beyond consolation, especially the father. Yeah. So uh, a, a view of uh, life as gift. How do we bring that back to our economic, social, and business framework? The second is a return to faith in the creator and our role as stewards. A steward respects the will of the true owner. A steward does not pretend to be the owner. A steward does not misuse or abuse the gift of creation. In Laudato Si, 
Pope Francis calls for ecological conversion that combines attention to environmental ecology and human ecology. He also invites us to exercise ecological justice as intergenerational justice. What world will we give as a gift to the next generation? But only the mindset of stewardship will make us responsible in the use of creation. If we pretend to be the owners, then my will be done, not the will of the one who created it. The third is a pursuit of the common good. Economic activity as an engine for wealth generation must be coupled with distributive justice in order to achieve the common good. Now, from one perspective, the common good is the social environment within which individual persons and families can grow and develop to their full potentials. Thus, the social environment can be considered a common wealth, a common treasure, a common good, for it will benefit individuals and families. As we all need a healthy social environment to grow in, we also need to contribute <laughs> to its development. I don't, I don't only uh, expect the social environment to benefit me. I must contribute to the common good. So related to the pursuit of the common good is the church's vision of the universal destination of the earth's goods. In Genesis, God told the first human beings, see, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food. And God said, oh, everything is good. Now, when God sees what is happening in our world right now, will God be able to say, oh, Everything is good. <laughs> if profit becomes the ultimate goal or end of all activities and not the common good, we will destroy wealth rather than create wealth. We will be creating poverty. So that's the end of the first point. The second is a common examination of consciousness. Please hold on to your seats, please. As I, I'm holding on to my seat too. So, so uh, after proposing a renewed vision of the human person, society, the e economy and development, the second part, as I said, is an examination of consciousness is the inclusion of the presently excluded people. And I appreciated what I heard from uh, the one from Argentina a while ago. And she said, yeah, there's so much talk. Let us do it now. No. So I hope my points here will help push your uh, un, un, un pequeño papa. No. <laughs> You're Argentina here, there. <laughs> so the pursuit of inclusive growth, when taken seriously, must be acted upon in, <laughs> in concrete ways. Now, I think all of us dream of uh, integral development and inclusive growth, but it has to be acted on. So we ask, who are excluded? Uh, who are those that are excluded? The outcast, the poor. For us, Christians, the poor, the word poor is not just a sociological or economic or political term, but it is also a theological term. That's why we have to act on it. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verse 9, we are told, 
the poor person might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. That's why we need to examine our consciences. <laughs> A few questions that we can take home for our examination, even corporate examination. First question, are the poor included in our vision mission statements? For example, in your banks, in your businesses, we, we are working for inclusion. Are the poor included in the vision statement? No. In the mission statement? Or are they also excluded there? After all, we want the vision is not just a statement. It is it's supposed to lead, lead individuals and a body. If the leading statement excludes the poor, oh well, no wonder. In the policies and the actions, the poor are excluded. The second question, are the poor included in our goals and planning? And if ever they are present, how are they present? As consumers, as commodities, or as partners? Third question, is the development of the poor a factor in deciding what items to produce or services to offer? Some of the products produced can never be bought by the poor in their lifetime. Fourth question. Are the poor consulted in the type of development that they desire? Or are we, or, or, the, or the comfortable uh, and the developed imposing a vision of development which the poor may not even need? When I was a, a much younger bishop, you know, some politicians and uh, business people approached me, said, Bishop, please convince these farmers to leave their land to sell the, uh, the, the farmland to us, and they will have a better life. I said, but that is their life, farming. What will you do with the land? They said, we will convert it to a golf course. And they told me, tell the farmers to start training themselves now as restaurant waiters, and golf caddies. And I told them, and what made you think that these farmers want to become restaurant uh, waiters and golf caddies? That's your vision of development. But they want to farm. They stopped talking with me. Fifth question, is our social corporate responsibility an appendix to our corporate life? Or is it integrated in the way we do business? For example, corporations contribute to humanitarian relief efforts. But do the cor corporations also contribute to the ecological disasters? that are now in need of humanitarian response. Just asking. <laughs> and sixth and final question. In our offices and establishments, are our workers, our personnel, trained to deal with the poor? Are they respectful to the poor? Are our labor practices fair to the poor among us, the low-ranking employees, workers. And finally, so that you can be freed, <laughs> the third section here, the need for personal encounter with the excluded people. 
And here our inspiration again is Pope Francis. In Laudato Si, number 49, he says, and I quote, It needs to be said that generally speaking, there is little in the way of clear awareness of problems which specially affect the excluded. Yet they are the majority of the planet's population, billions of people. These days, they are mentioned in international, political, and economic discussions. But one often has the impression that their problems are brought up as an afterthought, a question which gets added almost out of duty or in a tangential way, if not treated merely as collateral damage. Indeed, when all is said and done, they frequently remain at the bottom of the pile. This is due partly to the fact that many professionals, opinion makers, communications media, and centers of power being located in affluent urban areas are far removed from the poor with little contact with their problems. They live and reason from the comfortable position of a high level of development and a quality of life well beyond the reach of the majority of the world's population. This lack of physical contact and encounter, encouraged at times by the disintegration of our cities, can lead to a numbing of conscience and to tendentious analyses which neglect parts of society. So he's challenging all of us. Go to those who are excluded. Get in touch with them. Touch their hands. Enter their shanties. In Nepal, we visited a village, one of the villages destroyed by the earthquake, Avala, a uh, uh, landslide. And in that district, 3,000 people died, just in that district. And when we went there, there's no drinking water available anymore. And uh, it was already 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and no one was offering us lunch. Then we realized no one had food. They could only offer to us flowers, their lace. They composed poems. They composed songs. Thanking the church and Caritas for responding to their needs. And there was not a single Christian there. But it shakes your, your sensibilities to visit a community that has nothing to eat. The excluded are not categories or numbers, but persons. Just like us, with feelings, with hurts, with thresholds, and with dreams too. We come to the poor and the excluded not in a condescending manner, not from a, a position of superiority, but from a position of solidarity, even a posture of humble learning from their wisdom, the wisdom that only the poor possess. Business and corporate pursuit of inclusive growth should begin with the inclusion of poor persons in our consciousness. To teach us and to move us to action. 
When I visited the refugee camp in Idomeni, Greece, last October, and they told me it was a, a rather a slow day. I said, you call this a slow day? In one hour, only 1,500 refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq came. And they considered it a slow day. But the border with Macedonia was still open at the time. So we moved uh, and uh, talked with them. And, uh, but I was very much impressed by the uh, lady, the vice mayor of the town, who was uh, managing the distribution of relief goods. So when there was a, a pause in the activity, I asked her whether it was her role as a, uh, it was part of her task as a vice mayor to supervise the distribution of relief goods. And she said, no. So I said, oh, are you not busy as vice mayor? You even <laughs> embraced this massive uh, operation? No? And she said, my ancestors were refugees. My ancestors were refugees too. I have refugee DNA in my body. They are my brothers and sisters. I will never abandon them. Beyond theories and legalities, I have refugee DNA. That was her only response. Not forgetting her forebears. Let me close with a quotation from Pope Paul VI in Populorum Progression. We are all united in this progress toward God. This is, a, this is really moving for him to say that this, this, this journey towards development and progress is not just a, a human social journey. It is a progress towards God. We have desired to remind everyone how crucial is the present moment, how urgent the work to be done. The hour for action has now sounded. At stake are the survival of so many innocent children and for so many families overcome by, by misery, the access to conditions fit for human beings. At stake are the peace of the world and the future of civilization. It is time for all peoples to face up to their responsibilities. It doesn't sound like 1967. It sounds like 2011. 16. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow, 8.30, at the Patreon entrance. Good evening.